Well, good morning. What a beautiful day. And so good to be together, whether we're here in this space or you're joining online for this opportunity that we have to worship together. When you think back on this week, can you come up with any highlights in the week? A few things that were good about this week, right? It's worth pausing just from time to time to remember that. Some, some good things did happen too, right? And as you think about the week also, can you, um, can you think about a time or a couple of times when you sense God's presence? Through a nudge, through a, uh, an event, a word that was maybe given to you or that came to mind, some insight. We focus on God when we come together on a Sunday morning and concentrate on God's goodness and presence, but it's so important to remember that God's active through the rest of the week, right? And God's with us and in us and around us, wherever we go, whatever we're doing. And so we want to bear that in mind as we are moving through our days. And then as we come to times like this, we concentrate our attention, in giving thanks and praise to God for God's goodness and in drawing close to the Lord and being prepared for whatever lies ahead. So as we come to this place, let's be here. Let's take a breath. Let's focus. And let's prepare to worship the Lord. Please join me as we pray. Loving and gracious God, thank you for the day that you've made, for the life that you give, for all that you make possible because of your love and grace. And as we gather together today, one group among many engaged in this activity throughout this weekend, Lord, we're so grateful to be part of the larger church, to be people in whom you are at work. And we ask, God, that as we worship, our eyes would be open to you, our hearts receptive, that we might move closer to you, receiving more and more of your love and your grace. And so we ask your blessing on this time as we thank you for it, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand and join me in our call to worship. Praise be to the Lord, to God our Savior. You, God, are awesome in your sanctuary. Amen. Let's sing together.
And before you sit, would you find someone nearby and say hello? So each year about this time, we like to remember the kids who are going back to school, and uh, I heard from a couple of families this week that they wouldn't be with us today in worship, but we can certainly remember them and be mindful of the other kids we know about, our, our own kids and grandkids and um, those who are part of our networks, to remember what they are about to embark upon. And for those of us who can think back to our school days, we remember the start of school in different kinds of ways, right? Um, sometimes there's excitement, sometimes there's just a little bit of dread, uh, a little bit of concern that this wonderful summer has somehow come to a crashing end and now we need to do something else. But there's also this enthusiasm about going back into a place with friends and with people who have been um, focused on helping us. And somewhere along the line, it's entirely likely that we come across a teacher or an administrator or a staff person who's really on our side and really lights us up in some important ways. And so we can be remembering that as well. But as we think about these kids going back to school, we want to, um, we want to keep in mind that we can be supporting them, especially in our prayers as they are in these environments. For some, they're familiar. For others, they're going into new schools. And so it's a lot to take in. And we can be praying that God would be um, giving them the strength and the peace they need for this new season. Our promise from Scripture is that God is with all who love him and follow him. And we know kids like that. And we want to be praying that they will be attentive to God's presence and drawing on that strength. And we know about teachers, too, and administrators and staff and the, the pressures they face and the reality of trying to teach these days. There are a lot of challenges connected with that. And so we want to be praying for these people, too, who give so much of themselves, investing in the lives of these young people. So as we are considering the start of school, uh, for most of us, those are uh, past days. But we're probably aware of and know people for whom they are still very much a present reality. And we can be lifting them up in prayer today. And I'm going to invite you to join me in that. And then um, to see that this is not just a one-off experience for us. But let's, let's try to come back to this from time to time, remembering to pray for the students who are part of our church and connected in our networks. So let's pray together, shall we? Loving and gracious God, thank you. Thank you for the opportunities that we have to learn. Thank you that there's so much to know in this world that you have made. And as the season for school draws close, has already started for some, we want to be lifting before you, Lord, the students who are heading back or perhaps starting for the first time in these environments that may be new to them, may be familiar to them, um, places where they are likely to meet some challenges, places where they are likely to be delighted. Lord, we pray for them, that they would be aware that you walk with them, that you offer strength for them. We pray for their interactions with other students, that they would be kind and gracious, patient. And pray that as they interact with teachers and even with their parents, that they would be mindful of what you make possible. We pray for the teachers and for the staff and the administrators in these schools. We thank you for the many who give themselves over to this important work. And we pray, Lord, that they might move with real grace and kindness as they interact with the young ones and with each other. Thanks, God, that we can lift these matters before you with a real confidence that you hear us. And so we commit these kids and those who will be around them in support and help and encouragement, we lift them all before you, praying for your blessing and your good work. In Jesus' name, amen. You were the word at the 
beginning, one with God the Lord most high, your hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you our Christ. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a beautiful name it is, nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us, so Jesus, you brought heaven. sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a wonderful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a wonderful name it is, the name of Jesus. Death could not hold you, the veil tore before you. You silence the boast of sin and grave. The heavens are roaring, the praise of your glory. For you are raised to life again. You have no rival, you have no equal. Now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the King. Yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, what a powerful name it is. The name of Jesus Christ, my King. What a powerful name it is, nothing can stand against. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. You have no rival, you have no equal, now and forever, God, you reign. Yours is the kingdom, yours is the glory, yours is the name above all names. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. What a powerful name it is, the name of Jesus. Good morning. Um, First scripture lesson this morning is from Psalm 18, verses 28 to 36, found in your Pew Bible on page 781. To the faithful, you show yourself faithful. To the blameless, you show yourself blameless. To the pure, you show yourself pure but to the devious you show yourself shrewd. You save the humble, but bring low those whose eyes are haughty. You, Lord, keep my lamp burning. My God turns my darkness into light. With your help, I can advance against a troop. With my God, I can scale a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. For who is God besides the Lord? 
and who is the rock except our God? It is God who arms me with strength and keeps my way secure. He makes my feet like the feet of a deer. He causes me to stand on the heights. He trains my hands for battle. My arms can bend a bow of bronze. You make your saving help my shield, and your right hand sustains me. Your help has made me great. You provide a broad path for my feet so that my ankles do not give way. Our second reading is from Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 25, found on page 1714. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to center the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain that is his body, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold unswervingly to the hope we profess, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how we may spur one another on toward love and good deeds, not giving up meeting together, as some are in the habit of doing, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. The word of God for our good. And we are so grateful for your word, Lord, for the way you communicate with us through these pages. We're thankful for Jesus, who brings your word, who is your word, and how he directs us back to you. Guide us through this, we pray, by your spirit. Amen. (coughs) When Jesus is getting ready to leave, He gathers his disciples together for some final teaching and then they have a meal together before he is taken away. But as a part of that teaching, as a part of that interaction, we hear him talking about a range of ideas and topics. Among them is the Holy Spirit. And in John chapter 14, we hear some of those words recorded for us where Jesus is saying regarding the Spirit, I will ask the Father and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, namely the Spirit of Truth, the Holy Spirit. A little bit further on, no, sorry, he will give you the Spirit, the advocate, the Spirit of Truth. And then a little bit further on, he says that this advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and remind you of everything I've said to you. So Jesus is aware that the Spirit is coming, that the Spirit is necessary that the Spirit is valuable. And then when he talks about the Spirit, he uses this word advocate. Actually, advocate is translating a Greek word. The idea of an advocate, we understand, right? Someone who is by our side, someone who's got our back. It translates a Greek word that is paraclete. And if you want to say that with me, paraclete, paraclete. It's like parakeet with an L, paraclete, all right? It's built on a couple of Greek words that talk about called to be with. That's who the Spirit is, one who is called to be with the people of God. And that word paraclete gets translated in different ways depending on the version that you use. Advocate is one way. Helper, sometimes we see. And sometimes the word comforter, which speaks about this whole idea of being with someone, with someone for their good. The Spirit is with God's people, gives them strength, The Spirit encourages them for all that they are called by God to do. And so what Jesus asks for on behalf of his disciples, namely that God would send them the Spirit, we see taking place in the early chapters of Acts. The Spirit comes and fills these believers. And that empowers them, that enables them, that encourages them to go out and start living in ways that 
radiate the love and grace of God, that demonstrate what God has done, that invite people into this relationship with God that they're enjoying. We see the presence of the Spirit in the lives of these early believers as they are living in a very courageous way. The Spirit is with them, strengthening them, encouraging them. And so, for example, when Peter and John are called before the Sanhedrin because they have been preaching, and this is disturbing to the religious professionals of the day, to the point that they want to tell Peter and John, stop it. And they bring all of their weight to bear on these two guys who listen to them and then conclude after the Sanhedrin have laid out their case, Peter and John reply, and this is in Acts chapter 4, what's right in God's eyes? Should we listen to you or to God? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. Now, that's a dramatic statement, but think about it. These are two fellows who have been, up to this point, living in somewhat some obscurity, who, as far as we know, don't have a lot of formal education, standing up to the collected wisdom and, and power and authority of their day. What we discover is that these Sanhedrin are startled by that answer. And we read that when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were ordinary, unschooled people, they were astonished and took note that they'd been with Jesus. Jesus, who had asked that they be filled with the Spirit, which happens, and now here's the result. They stand up and boldly, courageously speak on behalf of God. We'll see further examples of that as we move through Acts. We see a man named Stephen, who again is brought to trial, uh, kind of a hasty trial, kind of a kangaroo court, and the result of this is Stephen is stoned for bearing witness to the work of Christ. But as he is dying, he speaks about seeing the Lord. We don't see fear in him. We see him boldly moving through all the way to death, this testimony that he bears. And there are less dramatic cases of this in the book of Acts as well, as people gather on a regular basis, as people go out with the message of Christ. We see these regular folks who, how do you account for this? They have been filled by the Spirit. They are routinely being encouraged by the Spirit. The Spirit is pouring courage, pouring strength into them to carry out the work that the Lord has called them to do, even under significant pressure and challenge. Acts shows us a number of these instances. And then as we go deeper into the New Testament, we read letters from the apostles to early believers who are reminding them about the work of the Spirit and how the Spirit is available to them and who are calling them into the work that God gives them to do. They are being told to keep trusting the Lord, to keep serving one another, and it's not, it's not an easy life, but it's a good one. And it's a life that is helped along by the Spirit, by this paraclete, this one who has been called to be with them. And then something remarkable happens in the writings of the apostles, in the teaching of the apostles. We hear, for instance, the apostle Paul saying this to the Thessalonians. I want you to, uh, as he has been describing what is, going, what is ahead for them, he says at the end of this passage in chapter 4 of 1 Thessalonians, encourage one another with these words regarding what is to come. And then a little bit further on, he repeats himself again. Encourage one another. Encourage one another. Build each other up just as you are doing. 
Paul is urging the Christians to encourage each other. And what's intriguing about this is that the word that he uses is a form of paraclete. What the Spirit does, what the Spirit has done, Paul is saying, you do as well. You can and you will. And you are, in fact, doing that. Now, Paul's not the only one who says this. We hear the same instructions in the book of Hebrews. And when Missy read for us earlier from chapter 10, we heard that phrase in there. Encourage one another and all the more as you see the day approaching. It's the second time, actually, that writer has used that phrase. The first time is in chapter 3, when he says, encourage one another daily. And so we get this idea. The Spirit comes to encourage and does. And then we discover we too, we who follow the Lord, we who trust the Lord, we too are called to be encouragers ourselves. Now let's pause for a moment and just think about this whole idea of encouragement. Earlier today I asked if you could come up with any highlights from this past week and I saw a lot of smiles, a lot of nodding heads for that. Here's another question. Can you think of someone who has encouraged you? Right? Okay. And possibly you can think of that happening more than once. You, that's happened to you on a couple of occasions, perhaps often. Um, you know what? Let's just take a moment. Ask someone nearby, has there been someone who has encouraged you? And just see if you can get a name or a, an event when that's happened. Okay. Heaven for you. That's so interesting, right? I mean, we can come up with this. Let me ask the question a different way. Um, have you ever been criticized? I mean, not in a sort of constructive way, but in a kind of a one of these types of things. Anybody ever come to you and done that? Caught you up short? Yep. Uh, just on balance, which do you prefer? <laughs> right? It, it's, you know, <laughs> there's hardly a choice to that. Right? Why do we like being encouraged? Why do we remember that? Probably because of how it makes us feel. I have a couple of letters in my desk that I keep there. Are, I was going to say years, but they're decades old for people who have been very important in my life and who have included a line or two in that letter, a word of encouragement. And I can still remember that. Every time I touch that page, I can remember that event. And maybe that's been the case for you as well, hopefully more recently than decades. But we know what that feels like. We know what it leads to, this encouragement. We know what it's like when there's been pressure on us for different kinds of reasons, when there have been difficult tasks or challenges that have been there, and someone comes along with just the right word, or a couple of people come along and offer to surround us and pray for us, or an email shows up in our box, or there's a phone call that we hadn't expected, and it's just what we need to hear. We've had that experience. There's a story, there are a number of these stories in the scriptures, but there's one that came to mind out of Exodus chapter 17, where God is calling the people of Israel, uh, the children of Israel who have recently left Egypt, he's calling them into the promised land, and on their way into that, uh, there are a few skirmishes that they have to deal with, a couple of uh, fights and battles that they have to get through before they can enter the promised land, and on one occasion, the Lord tells Moses, I want you to go up on that hill and raise your staff. Hold up the staff that you've been carrying with you. And as long as you keep that above your head, 
the uh, armies down below, the children of Israel, their armies will prevail. But if you let that staff drop, they're going to lose. So up the hill Moses goes, holding up a staff. You ever tried to hold your hand up for any length of time? Now put something that weighs five or eight pounds into your hand. So here's what's remarkable about this story, is that Moses doesn't go up the hill alone. On one side is his brother Aaron. His, on the other side is a guy named Hur. You ever seen the movie Ben-Hur? Not that guy, different guy. <laughs> but this guy's name is Hur. H-U-R. So there's Aaron on one side, her on the other side. And first they get Moses a rock so he can sit on the rock and hold up the staff. And then when he starts to kind of dip a little bit, they come with him and they each of them take hold of his arm and they hold his arm up. I love that story. That is such a powerful story. There's so many layers to that story. But you get that visual image of these guys who say, we are right here with you. We are going to, you can use our strength to make you strong. That's encouragement. That's encouragement. David speaks about this in Psalm 18, again, that we heard Missy read earlier. With your help, I can scale a wall. I can do whatever it is you call me to because you give me the strength for it. You encourage me, David saying to the Lord. One of the opportunities that we have as a group of people called into a local church is to encourage one another, to notice how God has encouraged us and then to take seriously the opportunity that we have and the resource that we have to encourage one another. Now, that encouragement certainly is not limited simply to the friends and members of a particular church, no. But a local church is a wonderful setting for practicing encouragement because we need to practice. That's the case because so often what we see modeled around us when it comes to interactions among people is not encouragement. It tends to go in the other direction. You know the phrase, he got thrown under the bus? Or the phrase, I got thrown under the bus? Anybody been under the bus? Yeah, we know about this. It's happened, right? So encourage one another. Now, how do we do this? Well, again, go back to what's happened in your own experience. How have you been encouraged? What has happened to encourage you? You know, there's some space in the bulletin that you received this morning under the place where the message is there. You might just jot down a, a line there real quick, a word or a phrase that says, I was encouraged when this happened, or here's what encouraged me. You know, I'll give you just a moment to think about that and scratch a line or two on that. When we think about how to encourage someone else, very often we know how to do that because of what has happened for us, what has worked well for us. Someone shows up to help out. Someone offers a word at the right time. You know the phrase, um, if you see something, say something? We often associate that with something that's gone wrong. But what if we were to use that by way of encouragement? If you see something that someone's doing that's really good, just point it out and say, you know, when you did that, it dot, 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 this is what happened. To verbalize that, to put that into words, to give that back to someone, that's an example of encouragement. Maybe you've sensed, as you've gone through your days, maybe you've sensed that you should call someone or pray for someone or somehow reach out and make contact with someone and you follow through on that nudge and they say, oh, this came at just the right time. That's the Spirit helping. The Spirit who encourages helping us to encourage others. Of course that's going to work. That's what the Lord is after. Encourage one another. Paul says it. The book of Hebrews says it. 
Interesting that in Hebrews, we see that phrase in chapter 3, encourage one another daily. Think of how many things you do on a daily basis. And when you, when you actually get down to listing it, you realize there aren't that many of them. You do lots of stuff, but you don't do a lot of things every single day. And here's the writer saying, encourage one another daily. On the list of things that's like eating and sleeping, encouragement belongs on that list. It's not like a vacation that we take for a couple of weeks a year, really look forward to, and it's great, and it's just terrific, but it's only a couple of weeks of the year. It's a real exception to the normal routine. Encouragement is meant to be something that happens on a regular basis. Encourage one another daily. The apostles are encouraging us to engage in activity that builds. And that's what encouragement does as we pour strength into another that builds people up. It helps to foster an environment of peace and acceptance and grace. As we encourage, we can be reminded of what Jesus asked, namely that the Spirit would come, the Spirit who encourages we can, be, we can remember what the Spirit does, how the Spirit encourages us and those around us. And we can remember, too, what the Father wants as we move through our days, seeking to live well and to do good. So let's pray. And as we go into this, let's take a quiet moment for two things. First of all, Let's thank the Lord for the encouragement that has come our way, whether it's from the Lord, through the Spirit, by the Scriptures, through the mouth of someone we know and care about. Let's express our thanks for the encouragement that has come. And then secondly, let's ask the Lord for opportunities to encourage those around us. And of course, if we're going to ask that of God, we want to be attentive to those opportunities when they come, that we might walk into them well. Thank you, Lord, for the gift of your spirit. Thank you for your spirit who encourages, who pours strength into us at times of need, of whatever the intensity of that need. And thanks that you entrust to us this powerful, life-affecting ministry. We thank you for those who have encouraged us, and we pray, God, that we ourselves might be good at encouraging others. We We would hear your direction through the apostles and take to heart ways we can be an encouragement to those around us. Please help us in our resolve. Guide us by your spirit, we pray. Through Christ, amen. We can pray for people to be encouraged even if we don't have direct contact with them. And our prayers end up in some ways that are perhaps a little difficult to understand and yet relatively easy to appreciate that our prayers do end up bringing encouragement. And so we spend these next moments praying with and for one another. And as we do that, let's keep in mind the list of uh, needs and situations that circulates uh, through the week. We have a list that's in our foyer that you can pick up today if you'd like. I want to add a couple of things to this list. <clears throat> First of all, we got news that Larry Howell's mother uh, died earlier this week. And um, the funeral service is today. 
uh, 2 o'clock at Mount Olivet United Brethren Church in Newport. And if you need some more information, uh, Marilyn Beistel can help you with that. But let's pray for Larry and for Kay in this time of loss. Um, some of us have been following news about what's going on in Hawaii with uh, the fires there, uh, reports of some severe weather coming into uh, the coast of Mexico and Southern California, places that don't normally get this kind of weather. It's being predicted that that will happen. And lots of other things going on around us. So as I lead us in prayer, I invite you to pray along with me with, to lift up these matters before the Lord. We thank you, God, that you hear us. We thank you that you invite us to come as we, in prayer. And we do that now with real boldness and confidence, trusting that you'll be at work. And so we lift before you these various needs and situations. We pray for those who have experienced recent loss. Pray for the Yarish family. We pray for the Howell family, for others we know. We pray for those dealing with illnesses, those facing decisions, those who are trying to navigate complicated relationships. We pray for these who are on our minds and in our hearts, for the Roberts family, for Matt Hepler, for Edward, for Kathy, for Nancy, for Lynn. We pray for Chaz, for Joe. We pray for Faith and for Sherry. We pray for Kelly and for Hillary. We lift God Doris and Jean and Mary. We remember John and Jordan and Pat and these others, Lord, who we put before you now. And Lord, along with these who are familiar to us, we include people in situations that you're inviting us to lift before you, government leaders and the work they have, that they might seek you, that they might move towards what promotes peace and justice. We pray for your church and we thank you, God, for so many faithful around this world who bear witness to you, who show by their lives the presence of your spirit, your empowering, encouraging spirit. We pray for this church. Lord, as the schedule shifts now and we become a little more active in different things we're doing together and in our in and in our community. We pray for your guidance and for real wisdom as we interact with each other, that we be kind and careful. And then, Lord, we pray for ourselves that you would help us to want what you want to walk in ways that honor you. And so, Lord, as we draw all of this together, 
We want to do this in the name of the one who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Before I sing this next one with, with Betsy, I just want to say thank you for inviting us into your uh, congregation this morning, and myself, my husband, and our noisy active toddler. So <laughs> um, I've worked with Betsy for about nine years now. She gives up her time and talent so willingly um, to accompany our elementary choir. I'm an elementary music teacher. Um, and she does it so willingly that when she asked me um, to sing it, your church this morning, I said absolutely without hesitation. So thank you guys for having me and enjoy this next song. It's one of my personal favorites. darkest hour when I cannot breathe fear is on my chest the weight of the world on me everything is crashing down everything I have known when I wonder if I'm all alone I remember Above all the lies, I know I can make a way. I have seen giants fall. I have seen mountains move. I have seen waters part because of you. I remember. thinking about I can't stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about your goodness goodness I can't stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about I can't stop thinking about your goodness goodness I can't stop thinking about about. I can't stop thinking about your goodness, goodness. I can't stop thinking about, I can't stop thinking about, I can't stop thinking about your goodness, goodness. I remember, 
Thanks be to God for his presence, for his gifts. And as we bring our offerings now, may they be an expression of our gratitude with the prayer that they might be used for God's glory. And so we commit these gifts to you, Lord. We thank you for the resources with which you bless us and return a portion now asking that they might be used in ways that bring honor to your name and do good in the lives of many. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. 
What a wonderful day today is. Praise be to God. I'm Bill Miller. I serve as a deacon here at St. Thomas, and I also serve as consistory president. Here are some notes about upcoming services and activities. First of all, thank you to Vicki for coming to sing for our church. It was very, very beautiful. Thank you very much. The next Fire Pit Fellowship is later this month on August 29th. Bring a chair, invite a friend to relax around the fire, eat s'mores, and listen to music from Down to Earth Duo. Also, keep this date in mind on your calendar on September 10th. We'll meet at the home of Steve and Wendy Hepler for an outside service and picnic. You'll find more information on this in the bulletin. The Bolton also lists several ways to help folks in the community. So please take a copy with you and be praying about ways to participate in one or more of these. Thank you very much. Please stand. So as we hear Jesus' words of instruction and promise, we know that the Spirit is with all who love and follow the Lord, encouraging us to walk in ways that are honoring to the Lord. We can draw on this Spirit to encourage one another to be a blessing as we move into whatever lies ahead. So as we go from this place into what is waiting for us, let's be mindful of the opportunity that we have to encourage in God's name. Amen? Amen. Amen.